Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together to join in this wonderful, rich tradition we call Torah, which we both receive and contribute to. We are this week in Parshat Vayikra, which is the very beginning portion of the book of Leviticus. So we'll start with book of Leviticus, chapter one, verse one. And we will read through the English translation of our portion. I'll share with you a focused study about it, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation about it. If you'd like to unmute at this time, together we can recite our blessing, giving thanks for this moment. Baruch Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. So once again, we are in the book of Leviticus, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. I'll share with you the opening verses, and then I'll invite others to have an opportunity to read as well. Adonai called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the Israelite people and say to them, When any of you presents an offering of cattle to God, he shall choose his offering from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall make his offering a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting for acceptance in his behalf before Adonai. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, that it may be acceptable in his behalf in expiation for him. The bull shall be slaughtered before God, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall offer the blood, dashing the blood against all sides of the altar, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The burnt offering shall be flayed and cut up into sections. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and lay out wood upon the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall lay out the sections with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. Its entrails and legs shall be washed with water, and the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to God. Richard, will you read a little bit there at verse 10? Yes, thank you, Rabbi. If his offering for a burnt offering is from the flock of sheep or of goats, he shall make his offering a male without blemish. It shall be slaughtered before the Lord on the north side of the altar, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall dash its blood against all sides of the altar. When it has been cut up into sections, the priest shall lay them out with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar. The entrails and the legs shall be washed with water, the priest shall offer up and turn the whole into smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. If his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, he shall choose his offering from turtle doves or pigeons. The priest shall bring it to the altar, pinch off its head, and turn it into smoke on the altar, and its blood shall be drained out against the side of the altar. He shall remove its crop and its contents and cast it into the place of the ashes at the east side of the altar. The priest shall tear it open by its wings without severing it and turn it into smoke on the altar upon the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a pleasing order to the Lord. Thank you. And June, would you like to continue there at the very start of chapter two? Thank you, Rabbi. When a person presents an offering of meal to the Lord, his offering shall be of choice flour. He shall pour oil upon it, lay frankincense on it, and present it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priest shall scoop out of it a handful of its choice flour and oil, as well as all of its frankincense, and this token portion he shall turn into smoke on the altar as an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. And the remainder of the meal offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, a most holy portion from the Lord's offering by fire. When you present an offering of meal baked in the oven, it shall be of choice flour. 
unleavened cakes with oil mixed in, or unleavened wafers spread with oil. If your offering is a meal offering on a griddle, it shall be of choice flour with oil mixed in, unleavened. Break it into bits and pour oil on it. It is a meal offering. If your offering is a meal offering in a pan, it shall be made of choice flour in oil. Thank you so much. Let me invite Margot if you'd like to continue there at verse 8. When you present to the Lord a meal offering that is made by any of these ways, it shall be brought to the priest who shall bake it up, uh, up who shall take it up to the altar. The priest shall re remove a portion from the meal offering and turn it into smoke on the altar as an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. And the remainder of the meal offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, a most holy portion from the Lord's offering by fire. No meal offering that you offer to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for no leaven or, or honey may be turned to smoke as, as an offering by fire to the Lord. You may bring them to the Lord as an offering of choice products. Pro, pro, but they shall not be offered up on the altar for pleasing odor. You shall season your every offering of meal with salt. You shall not omit from your meal offering the salt, the salt of your covenant. Uh, really, the, the the salt of your covenant with God. With all your offerings, you must offer salt. If you bring a meal offering of the first fruits of the Lord, you shall bring new ears, parched, parched with fire, grits of, of fresh grain as your meal offering of first fruits. You shall add oil to it and lay frankincense on it. It, on it. it is a meal offering, and the, and the priest shall turn a token portion of it into smoke, some uh, some of the grits and oil with with all the frankincense come uh, frankincense as an offering by first to the Lord. Fire to the Lord. Thank you. And uh, fire, fire the Lord. Robert, would you like to continue there at the very start of chapter three? Yes, thank you. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it to the Lord, whether it be a male or a female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an, it is an offering made by fire, of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering be a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord, be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof, thereof round about upon the altar. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat thereof and the whole rump. It shall he take off hard by the backbone and the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn it up upon the altar 
It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. Thank you so much, Robert. Justin, would you like to continue there at verse 12 and then take us into the beginning of chapter 4 as well? Thank you, Rabbi. Yes. <clears throat> if he, And if his sacrifice is a goat, he shall bring it before the Lord, and he shall lean his hand forcefully upon its head and slaughter it before the tent of meeting. And Aaron's descendants shall dash its blood upon the altar around. And from it, he shall bring his offering, a fire offering to the Lord, composed of the fat off covering the innards and all the fat which is on the innards. And the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, which is over the flanks. And he shall remove the diaphragm with the liver, along with the kidneys, he shall remove it. And the Kohen shall cause it to go up in smoke on the altar, consumed as a fire offering with a pleasing fragrance. All sacrificial fat belongs to the Lord. This is an eternal statute for all your generations in all your dwelling places. You shall not eat any fat or any blood. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a person sins unintentionally by committing one of all the commandments of the Lord, which may not be committed, and he commits part of one of them, if the anointed Cohen sins, bringing guilt to the people, then he shall bring for his sin, which he has committed, an unblemished young bull as a sin offering to the Lord. And he shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, and he shall lean his hand forcefully upon the bull's head and slaughter the bull before the Lord. And the anointed Cohen shall take from the bull's blood and bring it into the tent of meeting. And the Cohen shall dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the dividing curtain of the sanctuary. And the Cohen shall place some of the blood on the horns of the incense altar, which is in the tent of meeting, before the Lord, and he shall pour all the blood of the bull on the, the base of the altar used for burnt offerings, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the fat of the sin offering bull, he shall separate from it the fat covering the innards and all the fat that is on the innards and the two kidneys along with the fat that is on them, which is on the flanks, and the diaphragm and the liver, along with the kidneys, he shall remove it. Just as was separated from the bull, sacrificed as a peace offering, the Kohen shall then cause them to go up in smoke on the altar used for burnt offerings. He shall then take the bull's skin and all of its flesh along with its head and along with its legs, its innards and waste matter. He shall take out the entire bull to a clean place outside the camp, namely to the ash depository, and he shall burn it in fire on wood. Thus it shall be burnt in the ash depository thank you thank you so much uh, and david are you, would you like to read a little bit there starting at verse 13 okay we'll come back to you david that's okay uh Catherine, would you like to read a little bit, starting at verse 13 and uh, chapter 4? 
Yes, Rabbi, thank you. Um, if it is the whole community of Israel that has erred and the, and the matter escapes the notice of the congregation so that they do not do any of the things which by the Lord's commandment ought not to be done, and they realize their guilt when they sin, when the, when the sin through which they incurred guilt becomes known, the congregation shall offer a bull of the herd as a sin offering and bring it before the tent of meeting. The elders of the community shall lay their hands upon the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be slaughtered before Adonai. The anointed priest shall be, bring some of the blood of the bull into the tent of meeting, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of it seven times before Adonai in front of the curtain. Some of the blood he shall put on the horns of the altar, which is before Adonai in the tent of meeting, and all the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He shall remove all its fat from it and turn it into smoke on the altar. He shall do with this bowl just as is done with the priest's bowl of sin offering. He shall do the same with it. Thus the priest shall make expiation for them and they shall be forgiven. He shall carry the bowl outside the camp and burn it as he burned the first bowl. It is a sin offering of the congregation. Thank you, Catherine. And Jay, would you like to read starting at verse 22? Sure, thank you, Rabbi. In case it is a chieftain who incurs guilt by doing unwittingly any of the things which by commandment Hashem ought not to be done and he realizes his guilt or the sin of which he is guilty is brought to his knowledge. He shall bring as his offering a male goat without blemish. He shall lay his hand upon the goat's head and it shall be slaughtered at the spot where the burnt offering is slaughtered before Adonai. It is a purification offering. The priest shall take with his fingers some of the blood of the purification offering and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. All its fat shall turn into smoke on the altar like the fat of the sacrifice of well-being. Thus the priest shall make expiation on his behalf for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. Continue. Please. If any person from among the populace unwittingly incurs guilt by doing any of the things which by the Lord's command ought not to be done, and he realizes his guilt, or the sin of which he is guilty is brought to his knowledge, he shall bring a female goat without blemish as his offering for the sin of which he is guilty. He shall lay his hand upon the head of the purification offering, and the purification offering shall be slaughtered at the place of the burnt offering. The Kohen shall take with his fingers some of its blood and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and all the rest of its blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar. He shall remove all its fat, just as the fat is removed from the sacrifice of well-being, and the priest shall turn it into smoke on the altar for a pleasing order to Adonai. Thus, the Kohen shall make expiation for him, and he shall be forgiven. Thank you. And uh, David, would you like to read now or at verse 32 of chapter 4? Um, yeah, give me a moment. Hopefully the connection we continue. Can um and if he will bring a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring a female unblemished. Am I in the right place? Yes, 32, right. Uh -huh. Okay. And he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it as a sin offering at the place where he would slaughter a burnt offering. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and he shall spill all its blood at the base of the altar. And he shall take away all of its fat as the sheep's fat was taken away from the place 
from peace offering sacrifice. And the priest shall burn them to smoke at the altar with yud heh vav -Heh's offering by fire. And the priest shall make atonement over him, over his sin that he committed, and it will be forgiven for him. And a person who will sin in that he has heard a pronouncement of an oath, and he was a witness, whether he saw or he knew, if he will not tell, then he shall bear his crime. Or a person who will touch any impure thing, or the carcass of an impure animal, or the carcass of an impure domestic animal, or the carcass of an impure swarming creature, and it was hidden from him, so he had become impure and had become guilty, or when he will touch a human impurity, for any impurity of his through which he will become impure, and it was hidden from him, and that he had come to know and had become guilty, or a person who will swear so as to let out of his lips to do bad or to do good, for anything that a human would let out of his uh, let out in an oath, and it was hidden from him, and then he had come to know and had become guilty by one of these, and it will become it will be that when he becomes guilty by one of these, he shall confess that he has sinned over it, and he shall bring his guilt offering to Yud Hey Vav Hey over his sin that he has committed, a female from the flock a sheep or a goat, as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement over him from his sin. Thank you so much. Uh, June, would you like to continue now at verse 7 of chapter 5? Thank you, Rabbi. But if his means do not suffice for a sheep, he shall bring to the Lord as his penalty for that of which he is guilty two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a purification offering and the other for a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest, who shall offer first the one for the purification offering, pinching its head at the nape without severing it. He shall sprinkle some of the blood of the purification offering on the side of the altar, and what remains of the blood shall be drained out at the base of the altar. It is a purification offering. And the second he shall prepare as a burnt offering, according to regulation. Thus the priest shall make expiation on his behalf for the sin of which he is guilty, and he shall be forgiven. And if his means do not suffice for two turtle doves or two pigeons, he shall bring as his offering for that of which he is guilty a tenth of an ephah of a choice flour for a purification offering. He shall not add oil to it or lay frankincense on it, for it is a purification offering. He shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall scoop out of it a handful as a token portion of it, and turn it into smoke on the altar, which the Lord's offering by fire. It is a purification offering. Thus the priest shall make expiation on his behalf for whichever of these sins he is guilty, and he shall be forgiven. It shall belong to the priest like the meal offer. Thank you, Jude. And Margo, would you like to read again that there at uh, verse 14? Sure. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when a person commits a trespass, being unwittingly remiss about any of the Lord's sacred things, he shall bring as his penalty to the Lord a ram without blemish from the flock, con uh, convertible into payment in silver by the sanctuary, weighed as a guilt offering he shall make restitution for that for that where wherein he was remiss about the sacred things and he shall add a fifth part of it and give it to the priest the priest shall make expiation on his behalf with ram with the ram of guilt with the ram of his guilt offering and he shall be forgiven and when a person without knowing it, sins in regard to any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done, and then realizes his guilt, he shall be subject to punishment. 
he shall bring the priest a ram without blemish from the flock as an exp or the equivalent as a guilt offering. The priest shall make expiation on his behalf for the error that he committed unwittingly, and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering he has incurred before guilt uh, before uh, he has incurred guilt before the Lord. Thank you, Margo. Robert, would you like to continue there at verse 20? Yes, thank you. I had to. I have that as um, Leviticus 6, and the Lord spake unto Moses. Is that correct? Yes. We're at the chapter 5, verse 20, where it says, God spoke to Moses saying, when a person sins and commits a, a trespass. Yes, my version is just a little different the way it's Great. Said. Thank you. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or hath found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely, in any of all these that a man doeth, sinning therein, then it shall be because he hath sinned and is guilty that he shall restore that which he took violently away or the thing which he hath deceit, deceitfully gotten or that which was delivered him to keep or the lost thing which he found or all that about which he hath sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle and shall add the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock, with thy estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for anything of all that he hath done in trespassing therein. Thank and the you. Lord. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's the conclusion. Thank you. That's the conclusion of our entire Torah portion of the week. Uh, I invite you to take out a copy of the study sheet if you have it. I'd like to share with you a bit a uh, focused study about our portion. And we have uh, left behind Exodus. We've entered into the realm of Leviticus. In a sense, what we've done is We've left behind this thrilling, exciting narrative that we, we were a part of through the book of Genesis, and then the excitement about the narrative of liberation that is the book of Exodus. And now we've entered into this realm of Leviticus, which is uh, almost totally uh, bereft of any kind of narrative storyline. And instead we've replaced narrative with, uh, in essence, pure prescription of how things are to be done. And especially as we were all reading this material, I became just very aware and sensitized to how thick uh, this setting is. It's so thick with the rich materiality of, of all these sacrifices that are being uh, committed the both the animals and and the bread and and the blood and it's uh it, the 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 objects and the materiality of it just really struck me this time so i'd like to take us through a bit of study that in a sense subverts some of that thick materiality that is represented by the uh, descriptions of of all the sacrifices and to do that <clears throat> I'd like to take us back to the very beginning of our Torah portion and the word that gives the Torah portion our its name, Vayikra, which means he called, referring to God called. And when I encountered that this, this week in, in studying our portion, I recall that this, this phrase, Vayikra, uh, is also used back in the creation story specifically in chapter three of the book of Genesis. And I have that on our study sheet. Vayikra Adonai Elohim El Adam Vayomer Lo Ayecha. And 
it translated as God called out to the human being and said, Ayeha, where are you? So the same phrase of Vayikra is used to introduce this week's portion. And one of the remarkable things about it is that the final letter of the very first word, Vayikra, the Aleph there is printed in a much, much smaller uh, dimension uh, than the rest of the letters. So I'm intrigued by this, that there's this same phrase that's used, Vayikra in Genesis, Vayikra to Adam, and here Vayikra to Moses. And there has been some kind of evolution uh, in, in the story. I'm not sure if it's an evolution of God, if it's an evolution of the human being, if it's just an evolution of, a, of the storyline itself, but I'm, that, that's what it intrigued me. And there's a lot of midrash about, well, why is that letter Aleph so much smaller? And much of that midrash focuses on, it well, it represents uh, the greater humility of Moses, that he is somehow uh, constraining himself in this awesome setting of being called upon to make sure that uh, the, the Mishkan is set up properly, that these various rituals are conducted properly. And that as a result, uh, Moses had uh, wanted to, we would have preferred if Torah had said something like, oh, Moses just happened upon God. But in, instead he, he shrinks himself uh, as uh, and humbles himself. Well, that's a, it's a it's a lovely midrash, and there's, there's a lot to be learned from it. I want to explore something else that is along the lines of some of the themes that we have focused uh, in past weeks when we were looking at the Mishkan. If you remember when we looked at the Mishkan, one of the a lot of the midrash that we dealt with about the Mishkan talked about how Moses went up onto the mountain where. Uh, God said, make the Mishkan like this, like you see it. And the Midrash says, well, Moses wasn't shown an exact physical replication of what he was supposed to build. He was shown fire. He was shown red fire and green fire and black fire and white fire. And God says, there, make it like that. And then Moses begins to replicate what that fire meant to try and translate that that immateriality of the fire into something material like the the wood and the metal and all the fine linen and so forth so this is uh when i see this notion about the vaikra i would like to just pursue a little bit that maybe what's happening here is more akin and a, a kind of continuation of the fire lesson that is uh, was attached to the to the Mishkan, because what's being described here is more specificity about what is to happen at the Mishkan. So I'm intrigued that possibly there is a fire lesson that is trying to draw a connection between how the Mishkan was to be built and then consequently how it is to be uh, used and implemented. We have a lot of rabbinic commentary, uh, similar to the one here in number three, that is from the Jerusalem Talmud, which says, Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, the Torah given to Moses was written with black fire on white fire. So again, we have this Midrash that describes the Mishkan as being uh, shown to Moses as being con consisting of fire. And now we have uh, a lot of rabbinic literature, as evidenced here by the Jerusalem Talmud, that says the Torah itself was written in fire, black fire on white fire. So I'd like to pursue that a little bit. And number four, uh, we have a, from uh, Rav Kook, uh, who was, uh, Rav Kook was uh, a free state Israel in the early 20th century, uh, he was a Kabbalist and a chief rabbi in pre-state Israel. And he has a, a fascinating lengthy piece here about the 
white fire and black fire. He wrote, when we think about a Torah scroll, we usually only consider the letters themselves written in black ink. Yet the Talmud rules that every letter in a Torah scroll must be completely surrounded by parchment. The white parchment around the letters is an integral part of the Torah. Without it, the Torah scroll is disqualified. In fact, the white space is a higher form of Torah. It is analogous to the white fire of Sinai, a sublime hidden Torah that cannot be read in the usual manner. The white fire corresponds to the loftier realm of thought and contemplation. The black fire of the letters, on the other hand, is the revelation of intellect in the realm of language, a contraction and limitation of abstract thought into the more concrete level of speech. So now Rav Cook is telling us that the letters, the black letters, that's the black fire aspect of Torah. The space around the letters that represents the white fire of Torah. He's now indicated that the white fire is actually a higher level of Torah. Why is that? Well, one thing he says is the black fire is revelation, meaning it is a contraction and limitation of what is abstract. And the black letter is that is a, a, an evidence that a witnessing of apparently what God has gone forth and revealed to us. The white space represents um, something loftier, which has to be explored by human beings and then has to be uh, brought back to the rest of the community uh, from their exploration. So it's a form of revelation that is, in a sense, not being prescribed by the divine. It is a, a, re, a return, a treasure, if you will, that has been mined and discovered by human beings who have gone on this exploration and they brought it back. So this is the white fire represents a form of human revelation, if you will, by having gone in, in, into this white space. The Zohar, number five here, it goes, it says very explicitly, the sanctity of white fire is greater than the sanctity of black fire. So this, this is hinting that um, it's one thing for God to have proclaimed all this and to reduce it into, into writing in its very circumscribed and limited forms. It's a whole nother thing for human beings, if you will, to go on this journey of exploration into the white space and then to return to the community with, with these new insights. And what is brought back is at a higher level than what is appears in the black letters in the black fire. Here's uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson in number six, uh, also talks about this black and white relationship on the uh, Torah page. Every one of us is a letter in God's scroll. Together we comprise a single interdependent entity, but equally important, is the inviolable space which distinguishes each and every one of us as a unique individual. Mm. To detract from the individuality and uniqueness of one is to detract from the integrity of the collective whole. So now Rabbi Schneerson is emphasizing how precious uh, each one of us is. We each uh, are a part of Torah. Each one of us is a, is a letter in God's scroll. And while we are creating a collective story, it's important that we maintain our own individual uniqueness and, uh, and presence. So this relationship between black and white, uh, between the white fire and the black fire, the space as being not only incredibly important, 
perhaps even more important, which is what both Rav Cook and Rabbi Schneerson seem to be saying, that the space itself uh, is more important than the black letters. And if you remember, when we talked about the Mishkan, we talked about how the, the, the Mishkan was not only presented to Moses as fire, but that well, at the most essential element in the creation of the Mishkan uh, was not the materiality of it, it was the space that it was creating. And so this notion about space, I think is very important when trying to understand the Mishkan and what it's trying to produce. And the space, as both Rav Kook and Rabbi Schneerson are hinting at, is, is an invitation to us to leave behind our limitations and to go in some form of an exploratory journey into the richest, richer treasures that yet await us in Torah and to bring back what we've discovered on that journey. So I'd like to share with you now our artists. <clears throat> and if you can look back and on our first page, and this is a painting by Kazimir Malevich. Uh, Kazimir Malevich was uh, was born to Polish parents in Ukraine. <clears throat> and eventually uh, he goes to Moscow in the very beginning of the 20th century to go to art school there. And he is enthralled with all of the modernist art movements of the times, both Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, and then Cubism. And then he begins to develop his, his own style of painting, which he calls suprematism. And for him, what's important to him is to go beyond figure, figurative reality itself, to go beyond the, the figurative elements, to, to go beyond, if you will, objective reality, and to go into non-objective space, form, and color, in order to encounter a higher level uh, of existence, to encounter what he calls the ineffability of the absolute. So here we are, we have this painting, which he did in 1918. It's called White on White. And what you've got here are, it's a white square and then a, another white square on top of it. But there are subtle distinctions between it, one, uh, the, the top white square, the smaller one, has a cooler shade to it. The white square below it has much warmer tones. Uh, the square below seems to be stable uh, and, if you will, ongoing, eternal. And the square that's uh, smaller is uh, tilted as if it's floating on top of the, um, the larger one. Perhaps it's, we can't tell from this, but perhaps it's it's trying to adjust itself or align itself or tune itself in, in, in some kind of ways. But here, this is Malevich seeking to go beyond the limitations of trying to replicate reality, which is what art until that moment had been trying to do. And now he's saying to go beyond that, to transcend that, to go into, if you will, the infinite expanse of the universe. And so what he, he has done here, he's done that through a form of minimalism to show the infinity uh, of re reality. Uh, Malevich himself has a very, uh, was a very charismatic figure. He was actually, uh, he went to Vitibsk, which is where uh, Marc Chagall was born, his hometown. Marc Chagall uh, became... Uh, and embraced the early days of the Russian Revolution. He was the director of the art school in Vitebsk. Um, Malevich goes to Vitebsk and eventually displaces Marc Chagall. Uh, Marc Chagall, at this point, his paintings in these early days of the Russian Revolution are viewed as not in sync with the Russian Revolution because they're too sentimental and they're too individualistic. They're not collective enough in their expression. And so Malevich displaces um, Marc Chagall, who then leaves, uh, he leaves Russia uh, as, a, as a result. 
Malevich uh, is at first embraced uh, by the early Russian revolutionaries for his sense of wanting to overcome pre the pre-existing reality, to transcend the reality. Uh, but very quickly, by the mid-1920s, he becomes more suspect as a form of art takes uh, hold within the within the Russian Revolution, that of socialist realism, and they have no interest in the kind of um, abstract art that uh, non-objective abstract art that Malevich is, is engaged in. And he's actually arrested in 1930. And then in 1932, his paintings are displayed in an exhibition in celebration of the 15th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution but they're displayed with signs saying, this is degenerate art. And he, Malevich dies three years later. Uh, and it's not until the period of Glasnost that in 1988, that any of his works are then shown publicly again in, in Russia. So here was Malevich is someone who was uh, celebrating this moment of what, of what he thought of liberation from oppression uh, and that he thought he had an art form that was celebratory and supportive of that, only to find out that what he embraced and celebrated as a movement of liberation turned out to be another form of enslavement and, and, and oppression. But here is um, number seven. It's a lovely little uh, description of what Malevich's art is all about. It says, Malevich's art doesn't tell you a predefined story. Instead, it hands you a book of blank pages and a pen, urging you to draft your own narrative. It's an invitation to let go of reality for a bit and wander into the maze of your imagination. So I, and to enter into what we call the uh, title of our piece today, enter into a timeless presence. I want to suggest that what that's maybe what's happening here at the very beginning of this entrance into this apparently unexciting book we call uh, the book of Leviticus. We've left behind the thrill of the journey that has been Exodus uh, and Genesis and entering into this description of all these sacrifices and rituals and, and so forth. And it may be that Torah wants to remind us that really what's really happening here and what's most important is to carry over the lesson of the Mishkan, the creation of space and the use of fire, uh, and to not settle merely for the limited static black fire that we see, but to engage with the white fire, to go on a journey into that white space and discover some wisdom and bring it back to the community for sharing. So with that, I'd love to know what, what you saw, what you experienced either in looking at the painting and in, in reading our material in making the transition from Exodus into Leviticus. If you raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Richard. Just one thing really uh, to, uh, I see uh, looking at the, the page, the quote you have here in Hebrew, uh, the gestalt of the white, if you take the black away, there's a shape there to adhere to. Uh, and that's, you're offering us the gestalt of these two things go together, the black and the white, the white is gouged out and that this stuff settles in it. The other thing I see about this passage is that Everything gets excused. And there's only one difference amongst them all. And that is the very first one. If the person is a uh, ordained priest, he's brought blame onto the people. Hmm. And that seems to me so salient in all this that in some degree, maybe everybody who commits any kind of sin is bringing blame upon 
the race, the humanity, the single being that we all are. And that's what I got out of Fantastic. And uh, I'm going to come back to that in a second. I, I want to call on Catherine and then Robert. Catherine, please. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> it occurred to me, looking at the painting, that the square in the middle might be a shadow ah. instead of being a thing. It's a shadow of a thing. And, and go ahead. Uh, the other thing about it is that it gets us to question what the coordinates are. In other words, what is up and what is down? <laughs> um, what it, which, which of these squares is rectilinear? It, it's not clear which one is. I, I, I love these notions, both about uh, the shadow aspect of it rather than the solidity uh, of it uh, and, the, and the respective orientations. Um, and uh, when you said the word shadow, I, you know, I thought of Plato and the, and the cave and, and, yes. and all that, and like what's real and what's not real. Yeah, yeah that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let, me call, let me call upon Robert. Yeah. Well, thank you again for a lovely evening. And I apologize for being late last time. I had a problem with my, uh, my connection, my link. So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, this begins with God speaking to Moses. And then there's a great focus on outward sacrifice, outward offerings. And then we see woven into that commandments, sin, forgiveness, and so forth. So to me, that's an outward form to remind. But when we get later into Leviticus, and I remember this from our previous study, for example, in, eight, uh, in Leviticus 18, 4 and 5, the real offering that each one of us even today can relate to is the offering of our lower self to our higher self. And that has to do with, with um, command. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances. To walk therein, I am the Lord your God. That's 14, 15. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, I am the Lord. So the balance of, on the one hand, the seen and the hidden, the outward and the inward. So all the focus on offering at the beginning. So we understand it. We understand that this is important. But then later on in Leviticus, now, what is the real offering? It's our lower nature to our higher nature. And then I'm sorry, but after what you said about the the, the 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 painting, I just have to add this. You mentioned stability, and what immediately came to my mind was stillness and motion. So that within us, we have stillness and we have motion. So that big square, I could easily visualize as being the stillness, which is stability, isn't it? That anchors us. And then the one that's tilted, you can see it in motion. And what is motion? Motion is pursuing, rising, to become, to become better, to uh, arise and struggle, if you will. So because you said stability, that uh, that just really struck me. So thank you again for a lovely evening. Thank you both. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and and others? Yeah, uh, for, uh, yeah Richard, go ahead. Oh, just to say, to uh, going up what you're saying about higher and lower is, is today's uh, uh, half tour is Isaiah about let's let your heart speak, not the sacrifices. What's the sacrifices of your heart, not the sacrifices of the cows. Nice. And and to to uh, build upon that, to build upon both what uh, Catherine and Robert were, were talking about, um, you know, there there is a line of uh, commentary specifically within the, the Hasidic tradition, which, which looks at this material and say, Exactly in a sense what we were, we've been talking about, which is that what is what is happening here is that the beast is being uh, rendered 
in, into smoke. Uh, and and that the beast, as R Robert said, is the, is the lower self, the the animal instinct, if you will, it, is now being rendered in, into smoke, and uh, it, it should come as no surprise then that out of that tradition there is someone who was born into a Hasidic tradition who embraces the secular world, who takes that whole notion and develops a an entire human psychology around the notion of sublimation uh that that the, in order to in order to uh fit in with this world uh one needs to take these urges and then to uh elevate them for a higher purpose in order to have a a, a healthy psychology so this is a, a very a wonderfully rich and and in many ways radical uh discussion that we've been having because what, what this uh, tradition is telling us, uh, Rav Kook, uh, Rav Schneerson, uh, going back to the notion of fire, that, that what this rich tradition is telling us is that, uh, in a sense, we become, we become the, exp the explorers of the more sacred of the two fires. We become, if you will, responsible for taking the white fire, uh, the, the empty space, that which has not yet been reduced down to concrete letters that can be easily comprehended, which is the black fire, uh, that we, we become the guardians and the explorers of that more dynamic and higher level white fire, which is um, unformed, or to put it in Malevich's terms, abstract uh, and then to search there and to return and to share the lessons. So we have, um, we, we are fire workers. That's what, what this material seems to be saying. And we're gonna discover that it's not an easy, we're gonna discover soon. It, it, it's not an, an easy responsibility to handle. It's not an easy practice one can just jump into. It requires some training and some discipline. We're going to see shortly a story about those who dealt, thought they could just walk in and throw around some fire. That doesn't work out unless you have the, the appropriate um, posture and training and discipline and, and so forth. So uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for being part of uh, the timeless presence that brings uh, a richer and better a more sacred world uh, to, to all of us. Thank you all very much. I look forward to our next gathering. Be well, everyone. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good night.